Well, nobody threw tomatoes at me or anything, so. All right, this time I'm gonna start my stopwatch. There's an old saying, don't give a Cuban a microphone. He'll have it forever and start a revolution. So, <laughs> all right. So now we're gonna talk about IPL, this is gonna be great. All right, so how did this all uh, start? Uh, so I'm going to take you to the very beginning. So I, um, I actually started my practice right out of residency. So I was that a little bit crazy right there. I just graduated in 98. Uh, St. Jude's in Memphis uh, needed an ophthalmologist to look at these babies in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, it had no connection to Tennessee whatsoever. Went there. It was a great story. And I just said, okay. I'm in for this and I started my own practice and the first building uh, that I got actually had three pods. Um, so one pod was general ophthalmology, the other pod uh, was uh, LASIK and then we had this empty third pod. And uh, right about that time people were getting into aesthetics, especially Botox and fillers and so my practice administrator said, you know, you should, we should do something on the aesthetic side. I said, yeah, I, I actually have an interest in that. Uh, and I went full in, so not just Botox. So I went and bought uh, all these different types of lasers and one of the reps brought this thing called Intense Pulse Light and said, you have a lot of rosacea patients, you could use this IPL uh, for your rosacea patients. So I started doing that and then what I was seeing is a couple of the patients were saying, you know, not only does my skin look better and my face look better, uh, the redness is gone, but I think my dry eye is better. And then I started looking at lid margins and I said, oh, we've got something here. Uh, so this is with a luminous first generation uh, IPL system. So and we're gonna get into this later. So if I had 100 patients who had IPL and dry eye with a first generation IPL system in those days, maybe I would have five or six uh, patients say, hey, this is, this is helping me. So it wasn't like an instant, oh my gosh, this is, we're going to change the world. It was kind of like, oh, well, we got some people that, that did it. So I actually applied for an Ascaris uh, grant. So I was seeing this in my practice. Uh, we were fooling around with it. We thought this was helping some patients and wasn't helping others. We didn't have a protocol. We didn't have any of that. But I applied for this grant and uh, they gave it to me. So uh, it wasn't, like I said, everybody was turning their back. At least Ascaris said, okay, well, let's, let's study this. And from there, um, those first years from 2000 to 2007, I never charged any of my patients for uh, IPL. All I was doing was gathering information. So I'd have them come in, and at that time I was trying, when you hear these protocols, when you hear my protocol, where did that come from? That came from a lot of hard knocks. So in the first generation IPL systems, all they did was just flash a light. They just gave you this huge, big uh, flash of light, give you this energy, uh, and then you had to learn where to apply it. And the first, uh, thing that we would do is we would do a test spot right here so this is one of the reasons why you're always starting around the ear because this is was our little test spot and what we would do is we would apply IPL right there and then we would change energy levels based on how red their skin was so this is how scientific IPL was back in 2000 it'd be like Psh! Oh my gosh, that's really burnt. I'm so <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Mrs. Jones. Uh, we're we're going to put some aquaphor on that. Uh, we'll have you come back, and then I would write uh, 14 jewels on Mrs. Jones is not the thing to do. You know? So uh, then we'd have to figure out what redness was, was right. So just a little bit of red or how red. So just imagine if you were doing IPL for dry eye today and you were like had a card that showed redness on figuring out what energy levels was. So that was the difficulty uh, in all this. What's been great about Luminous is that they haven't rested on their laurels. They've actually tried to evolve the technology. And this is why I gravitated uh, towards them because a lot of uh, people in the IPL industry just, you know, they were like, this is our IPL and this is 
this is it. So let me tell you, I actually took IPL for dry eye to every IPL uh, company. Uh, and one of the funny stories with Luminous, I was supposed to have a meeting with uh, somebody from Luminous, and uh, I get to the meeting, he says, hey, come with me, I gotta jump in a cab, uh, I'm driving over here. So I got a five minute meeting with whoever's running Luminous at the time, and he said, nah, we have no interest in, in dry eye whatsoever. So that was my first meeting uh, with Luminous. But luckily, over time, people started to see that there was something here and that we could uh, help people, and then Luminous, uh, came to me again and we, we did it. So who does it help? It helps patients with meibomian gland dysfunction, but if you look at the first study that I ever did and that first case study that I published, what we were finding is in those patients uh, with, uh, we were finding increased in Shermer. So even patients with um, Sjogren's and patients with lacrimal gland problems were showing that they were actually producing more water. But I never talk, what I decided is I'm going to go this route and talk about IPL for MGD because if I get into MGD and it works for Sjogren's and it works with people would, would turn off. But if you look at it, one of the things that you have with IPL is you never want to treat below, below the neckline. Everybody knows that, right? So you want to treat the neck. So you're going to have patients say, oh, I love the way my skin looks, can you treat the neck? The reason being, it will actually stimulate the thyroid uh, because that gland will absorb that energy uh, and get stimulated by IPL energy. Well, the glandular tissue of the thyroid is very similar to uh, lacrimal gland tissue. So that's my theory on why this helps uh, those patients uh, with Sjogren's and a lacrimal problem. And then it was great to have these, it was fortuitous to have these rosacea patients be the patients that were talking to me about dry eye because now we know that uh, they have these small talangiectasias that are secreting inflammatory mediators that are breaking down the skin uh, and those glands. So that was a perfect start in, hey, these patients with rosacea, let's see if we can help their, their dry eye. So uh, even to this day, that's kind of your sweet spot in terms of patients. Uh, in terms of helping and helping immediately. All right, so we'll get into mechanisms of action. My first mechanism of action that I, that I had, and the only one I had at the time, was, okay, I know that this is closing off talangiectasia. So that was the only mechanism of action that I was actually talking about in 2005, 6, 7, uh, and 2008. That this light, if put at the epidermis, this so wavelength of light goes down to the uh, dermal layer where these talangiectasias are. The oxyhemoglobin is uh, absorbing it, and that's causing, cause, causing coagulation and closing off uh, those blood vessels. So that was, that was the first uh, mechanism of action, and it's something that we could actually see, that these patients who had red, rosacea skin uh, were improving. Then we noticed that non-rosacea patients that we did IPL in, you could just see that inflammation would decrease. So I'd have patients who had rosacea, and then they would have kids that had acne, and they'd go, hey, Dr. Troy, do you think this would uh, work for acne? And I'd be like, uh, yeah, let's do it. Um, and those patients were improved. So we know that actually it decreases the amount of inflammatory mediators on the skin, including interleukin-17. Then over time, we realized that light could be used to kill uh, bacteria. So, and you probably heard this more during COVID that the company Xenon had the Xenon uh, uh, flash lamp, the Xenex Corporation, where they would wheel in an IPL machine, close the door, and in a hospital, it would kill all the microorganisms. So that became another mechanism of action that we realized that uh, it was decreasing the amount of gram positive bacteria on the lid margin and also killing uh, Demodex. So this is uh, some work I did uh, with a group out in China where he has the ability to keep these Demodex alive for days after he takes them uh, out of their environment on the lid margin and then we hit them with IPL and those uh, Demodex 
uh, would stop in their tracks. So that became another mechanism of action, killing overgrowth of bacteria and kill, killing overgrowth of demodex. But then what started to happen is this wave of information started to be produced showing that we actually have this mechanism of action called photobiomodulation, where these wavelengths of light actually can stimulate the mitochondria uh, to upregulate and actually work better. So when people ask me what I believe is the number one reason why these patients are getting better uh, from IPL, I think this is on the top of my list. I think those other things are important, but I think photobiomodulation uh, is one of the most important. Why do I think that? Um, and this is going off my script, but I'll talk about it later. I've had patients on my biography, and I actually showed this way back in 2012, and again in 14, and then you had um, Dr. Arita do the same thing, where you take my biography of these patients, you hit them with IPL, it doesn't happen immediately, but you hit them with a series of IPL treatments, you do a biography later, and you see those glands coming back. So I never tell patients, oh, these glands are lost forever. Uh, because what I've seen over the years is that I can bring these glands back because of photo uh, biomodulation. So this is why IPL for me is a superior to any other uh, type of treatment in terms of my bone and gland dysfunction because of photo biomodulation. And we're seeing photo biomodulation in all uh, other areas of medicine. Infrared is being used in orthopedics. It's being used in retina. Uh, you're seeing red light stimulation for the epidermis by stimulating fibroblasts. Um, and then you have uh, the uh, optolyte. And then, and you'll see when I get into the FDA, expression versus non-expression. I don't know where this non-expression um, idea came from, but expressing glands, uh, even if you don't do anything else to patients, will help their meibomian gland dysfunction. There's several papers, one of them uh, by Dr. Wang, showing just expression will help patients with meibomian gland dysfunction. You add that with the power of IPL, where actually these wavelengths of light actually will uh, melt the toothpaste-like secretion to a form that you can actually express, and it also dilates the gland. So people ask me, do you do probing? No, I don't need to do probing because what I see in these glands, if you're not doing this already, look at patient's glands before you do IPL and then look at glands uh, after. You may squeeze, nothing comes out, but after you do an IPL, what you'll see is that the gland dilates and you've got some pouting of this uh, toothpaste-like secretion uh, out at the top. It's just sitting there for you. Why not express? After an IPL, it's just sitting. It, it actually would come out by itself just looking at it. Just look at it. So just <laughs> express them. So here's the theory on it. So our meibomian glands are different than any other glands, right? They're, they're like a test tube. They're not glands fed by anything else. So what happens is uh, they're uh, lined with cells that are making this Though it's supposed to be making this normal like secretion that's like olive oil. What happens is some of these glands start making toothpaste and little by little eventually that toothpaste just completely covers the gland. Right? So even if you have cells in that test tube like uh, gland making normal secretions it can't come out because it's stuck. So what you'll find is and this is patients ask me all the time, what, do you, what percentage you, of, my gland, of the gland do you think is working? And I'm able to tell them because you express. If you express those glands, you get all that toothpaste. So even if they have some cells in there that are making normal secretions, you can get some normal secretions out because that toothpaste is no longer there. Another reason to express is they're going to come back in a couple of weeks, right? If that toothpaste toothpaste-like secretion is still in there, you're actually giving another barrier of light uh, for the light to penetrate all those cells. Expressing the glands now lets that light penetrate into that whole meibomian gland without uh, any uh, blockage. 
And this is where photobiomodulation comes in because there's these outpouchings. You can get these, some of those outpouchings have cells in them too. When you express that gland and get all of that out, now those little outpouchings in that toothpaste like, in that uh, test tube like meibomian gland, that light can penetrate in there and get those cells working too. So you can actually start telling the patients when they come in for their second or third or fourth, how are they doing? Are they doing better? Is their gland completely filled with toothpaste or is it 50% filled with toothpaste? Are the cells getting better? Are they starting to make a better secretion? And so it, that's, that, that was my scientific nomenclature for uh, meibomian meibum. You know, it was a toothpaste that's severe. What happens is over time, what you'll see and you get IPL is instead of that white thick secretion, it'll start making more of a butter-like uh, secretion. So the secretion will be yellow, it'll be softer, till eventually that you get this olive oil-like secretion. So patients will come in and they'll, they'll ask me, is it olive oil today, is it butter, is it toothpaste? And then I tell them, and this is how they can gauge, and this is how you can gauge whether you're uh, becoming success, successful with your treatment. So if you look at our charts, it will say there, what is the MIBA consistency? And I check off either toothpaste, butter, uh, olive oil, right? So express. And either, I found that either you like expressing or you don't like expressing. If you don't like expressing, like it. <laughs> there's, so there's a new expressor from Oculus. So if you look at the old videos, and, and even in those videos there, it was a, a cotton tip applicator. So yes, that is not the greatest thing. Patients don't like it. But now we have a silicon tip expressor that I worked with Oculus that you can get. So there's, you have the Car Caratograph 5M here, correct, Oculus? So talk to your Oculus rep about getting these expressors, and if you can, I'll send a bunch of expressors to the Luminous reps and they can get them out to you. So a lot less painful, a lot easier on the conjunctiva, and it's great because it expresses so quickly, and I've, I've got a video of uh, the expressor later on. The physics of expression. So uh, this is important to, to uh, know because a vet, a vet, this is non-Newtonian uh, physics. It's the same non-Newtonian physics of a toothpaste um, uh, tube. So when I see people do these expressors where they just squeeze one time and that's it, basically you're only getting about half of this mybum out. So how non-Newtonian physics works is actually if you squeeze from the bottom this, and you could you go home and get your toothpaste and do this experiment for yourself. What happens if you apply force at the bottom of the meibomian gland, over time, that decreases the viscosity of the, uh, the meibom that you have in that gland. So if you look at expression videos that I show, I always squeeze and I just hold pressure there because over time, viscosity will decrease and you will get more of the secretion out. And in first expressions, I always express the glands and I actually come back to it and I express them again because I want to get uh, all of that out. So the best way to express is pressure below, constant pressure uh, below. And again, if you want to prove this to yourself, squeeze in the middle of a toothpaste tube and see how much toothpaste you get out versus squeezing from the bottom and keeping pressure there. You'll get much more uh, with the bottom squeeze. And then what you'll see, and the, the light is uh, not dark enough, but this is a patient that came in. You'll see these talangiectasias. The other thing that I like to measure is the distance between the meibomian gland to the eyelash margin. Patients with bad meibomian gland dysfunction and stuffed glands, this distance will be greater. The usual distance is 0.3 uh, millimeters or less. This is something you can measure on uh, the Oculus Keratograph or whatever Keratograph that uh, you have uh, in your office. Loss of eyelashes, you see the collarettes, the glistening from uh, Demodex and bacteria, uh, redness and stuffed glands. And then the younger the patient, the, the quicker they respond to treatment. So here's a that same patient and the eyelashes are coming back. That eyelash 
distance to um, meibomian gland is much shorter, uh, less erythema, uh, uh, less thickness of the lindvagin. So here we have all these mechanisms of action, killing bacteria, heat and expression, closing off talentectasias, decreasing inflammatory mediators on the skin and photobiomodulation. And then there's another one, uh, we don't know how this plays into it, but IPL actually decreases heat shock proteins. This is probably gonna be Nobel Prize winning work in the 1960s where uh, two uh, uh, students uh, left the room uh, that they were working on uh, fly DNA. They left the room, the cooling uh, system went down, they came back and they saw that they thought all their research was, was completely kaput but what they found was the DNA had swollen and they were like, well, and it was still functional. And it turned out that uh, the protective mechanism, uh, when you apply heat to DNA, either you can destroy DNA or actually it will produce uh, heat shock proteins that protect the DNA and make the DNA work better. So there is another component to the photobiomodulation that actually heat that doesn't destroy could make uh, something at the DNA level uh, work better. So this is something to keep your eye on. The, the biggest one that's studied is heat shock protein 70, and we know that IPL actually increases heat shock protein. That's why I have patients now that have been getting IPL from me for over 20 years, and they look much younger than their cohort. That's why I get IPLs, that's why uh, all my family likes to get IPLs because it actually will stimulate fibroblasts to work better, it will make skin uh, better. So there's several uh, papers, uh, my, mine being the first, which was a th three year retrospective, but now you have you know, over 50 uh, papers, which out of all those 50, you know, 95% of those papers are with luminous um, technology. And then we talked about interleukin-17 and how IPL actually decreased interleukin-17 on the skin, but we actually published a paper in AJO looking at interleukin-6, interleukin-17, and prostaglandins, and we showed that uh, IPL with the luminous system actually uh, decreased, decreased um, tear film, tear, uh, interleukin-17 and interleukin-6. Uh, so clinically significant decrease in the tier interleukin-17 in these dry eye patients. In my biography, I would say the two things that I use most now in terms of diagnosing and for follow-up, I think are lysamine green and my biography. I think they're, they're the two best things that I use. Tear breakup time, can be variable between uh, doctors. Dr. Savota actually uh, showed this. Um, Non-invasive tear breakup time on these keratographers uh, can be very sensitive. So if I record a six, the keratographer uh, uh, would record like a three. And I showed studies looking at this way back in 2011. But what is not subjective uh, is this is their biography, you get drop out of gland, you get sausaging of the gland, you get a distortion of the gland, the gland will move, will take a path instead of straight to a curly cue or, or you get partial drop out or you get drop out. And then you do your full set of IPLs, you redo the biography and you can see the improvement in the biography uh, over time. Okay, so this is something that comes up all the time. Well, if IPL works, then I can just use any old IPL. So, no. So, you know, this is, this is a phone and this is a phone. Okay, what phone do you, would you rather keep in your pocket? This one or this one? Same thing with IPL. There's different generations of IPL. You have the first generation IPLs, and you have, this is now, the Optolite's like the fifth to sixth generation uh, IPL system. There is a difference. The first generation IPL systems, and we'll go 
bit by bit on what the big difference is. But in the early days of IPL, what would happen is the first day I would use the IPL and I would put in 10 joules, it would give me 10 joules. I use it over time and what happens is the energy level off that xenon flash lamp will degrade over time so it gives you less and less energy. So in those first charts that you see that I was doing IPL, I would start out with 10 joules and then I'd have that bulb and over a course of three, six months, I would have to increase all the way up to 28 to 30 uh, joules. It would still only output like 10 joules, but that's the only way that I could get that flash lamp to uh, give me enough power to get that little redness on the skin. So that's the problem. You can't make a uh, protocol based on a first generation or a lower generation IPL system because the energy level is changing over time. So that's the great thing about the luminous optolite system is that energy level does not change over time. If you program 12 joules and that's the energy level that you want to use for your patient, you can, program, you can see them six months later, give them 12 joules, it will still give you 12 joules. So there's no varying on the energy level that it's giving you. And then it's a flat top energy level that when it's giving you those pulses, the energy isn't degrading in that milliseconds of pulse. So if you see in my parameters and protocol, we're doing six milliseconds. And again, six milliseconds wasn't you know, pulled out of a hat. Six milliseconds is what we found was the best terms of energy level influence to get the maximum uh, result. The only thing that you can play with is you can play with the joules you can, uh, and you can play with a the thermal relaxation time. You can't play uh, with the milliseconds if you want optimal uh, results. So that's another problem with other generation IPL systems. They, they don't let you change uh, those uh, parameters. So optimal pulse, this OPT, consistent energy levels equal dis distribution of energy. Now, what we found is when we're treating these patients, the lower you get from the lid margin, the decrease in efficacy. So what we found is the closer that we could get to the lid margin, the greater our efficacy. So going from 10%, I told you when I first started IPL, all the way up to 96% efficacy, which is what we have now. But the only way that we could do that with an IPL system is we need to be able to control the thermal relaxation time so that that thin skin of the lids can absorb the energy, disperse it out, uh, and not burn. The other thing is it's creating so much energy is if you don't have a cooling system on the crystal, it will build up that heat energy and even touching it with that uh, IPL foot plate can cause burn on that thin skin uh, of the lid. And I'm going to get into anatomy uh, later uh, in a later talk. So that's why you need these newer generation IPL systems um, to be able to get close to the lid margin, give that energy and have some thermal relaxation time so that you don't cause burn. The other thing I always contend with with people is they said, well, if a little energy works, why don't I just give more? And it doesn't work that way either. The, you know, the reason why we're using 10 to 16 joules is that we found is that uh, there's a uh, optimum amount of energy that you want to give. Uh, if you give too much, then again, you're causing destruction. You're not causing uh, improvement. So. These parameters, again, were not picked out uh, of a hat. This was through years of looking at energy levels and what the skin could take. And we already talked about flat top. So the pencil tip, and I'll, um, I think it's on this lecture, but people always used to ask me, well, you know, why in the beginning weren't you treating the upper lid? And the upper lid was very difficult to get all of this right because what, you find, what we find is when we give energy, thermal relaxation, IPL comes down and then thermal relaxation, that energy level disperses through the skin. When we were treating the lower lid, uh, what would happen is some of that energy would get up to the upper lid and disperse down towards the lower, uh, lower face. 
when we were working on the upper lid, due to the orbital bone and not much space here at the upper lid, the energy levels were always difficult to get where we weren't causing damage, instead that we were getting efficacy. So how we got to the pencil tip is through research using a small pencil tip, and I think I get into that uh, later. I'm almost done here. Here's me capping on first generation IPL systems again. They're very cheap. I mean, what's happening now in, in the world is if you have a company that has any old IPL system, they're going, oh, IPL for dry eye? Well, we'll just throw out our thing. So they, they take these $2,000 IPL systems, put a $30,000 price tag on it and say, hey, let's sell it. let's sell it to these people that really don't know much about IPL. So you can change the filters, there's a chiller plate, there's these, all these little tweaks over the years that uh, Luminous has made on the IPL system. So um, that's basically this lecture and then we'll get into uh, more in terms of orbital anatomy and uh, why this optolite. So again, this is, wasn't this, hey, let's just stick a pencil tip here. This is something that we have to really work on and we took three years to, to work on it. Thank you.